Good afternoon, uh, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, new uh, ETF's Learning Connects live session. Uh, today, uh, we have a very special focus, which is uh, career guidance for workers. Empowering people to realize their full potential and progress in their career decisions is key, and it improves their awareness of their skills, needs, and aspirations, and their understanding of opportunities. It promotes better skills used, contributing to productivity and motivation. So in this live conversation, which will be a short and punchy one, we will discuss about the importance of career guidance provided to workers and share inspirational practices. Why so? Because Career Guidance for Workers is also the title of a recently published joint brochure, uh, which is the product of an interagency working group on career guidance, which comprises the European Training Foundation, the OECD, CEDEFOP, the ILO, the World Bank, UNESCO, and the European Commission. And it's more than a brochure because it is a joint opinion and statement that can be used as an advocacy tool to make the case for investing in career guidance for workers. I'd like to begin with an extract from this uh, brochure. Supporting the career development of workers is a quadruple win for the individual, for organizations, for the economy and for society. The ongoing transformations in workplaces, occupations, economy and societies are creating pressure for workers to continuously upskill and reskill. In this context, it is fundamental to empower individuals to realize their full potential and progress vertically, horizontally, to achieve satisfaction and to find meaning in their career decisions. But I shout up now and I welcome our guests today. So welcome to Cynthia Harrison, Project Manager on Lifelong Guidance and Vet Supporting Policies from CEDEFOP. Welcome, Cynthia. And I'd like also to welcome Florian Kadlitz, Human Capital Development Expert at the ETF. Welcome, Florian. Hi. I'd like to welcome Glenda Quintini, Head of Skills Analysis and Policy Unit at the OECD. Thanks for being with us, Glenda. And I'd like also to welcome Pedro Moreno La Fonseca, Technical Specialist on Lifelong Learning at the Skills Branch of the ILO. Welcome, Pedro. Happy to be here. And uh, welcome to all of you who are following us. I am Daria Santucci, Communication Specialist at the ETF. We are live on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter. So let us know first where you're watching from. And please do share your comments and ideas because we'll bring them in the conversation. But now let's uh, get into the discussion straight. And I'd like to begin with uh, Pedro uh, from the ILO. So Pedro, uh, the ILO is commanded by countries to do more in the field of social justice. And can you explain how career guidance can support social justice, justice especially when looking at workers? Pedro. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, indeed, uh, the ILO has a strong mandate for the development of social justice. It's a very strong point also defended by our current director general. And in fact, uh, social justice has everything to do with the, the reduction of inequalities, with enhancing opportunities to learn, opportunities to access decent work, and therefore opportunities also to, to access social protection. And guidance uh, n cannot by itself, let's put it like this, be responsible for advancement of social justice, but it can be a very strong contributor if part of an enlarged strategy that coordinates other areas. So what, very briefly, what it can do, it can do many things. I mean, it can uh, help promote horizontal and vertical career mobility for workers, especially in the context of the current transitions to enable a just transition into digital rich society that is also becoming more environmentally friendly and help workers to uh, to reskill, to upskill. It can help transitions uh, into the formal economic sector. It can support worker migration. It can develop social capital and networks of workers. It can develop a, a sense of personal agency. It can also work as a strong advocacy tool for uh, uh, more vulnerable workers. The, I think the tricky part is the how. 
how this is achieved. And besides obvious mechanisms that already are put into place, like part of the labor market policies, there are things that can be done to enhance this support. Uh, guidance can be more linked to, for example, social assistance mechanisms to reach into the informal sector. It can be more associated with emergency response mechanisms and the construction of social and economic resilience. It can be more profoundly linked to human de develop, uh, development resource, resource development in enterprises to systems that support individual investments uh, in, in lifelong learning. Uh, and it, it also can be critical in terms of uh, uh, mainstreaming gender, gender sensitive approaches. So there's a very rich role that actually uh, guidance can play in terms of social justice. Thank you very much, Pedro. Um, you put the spotlight on uh, one of the on the tricky points, which is how this is achieved. And in this process, uh, a special role is uh, also played by uh, monitoring and uh, evaluation, which are key in ensuring quality um, for career guidance services, especially for workers. I'd like to to ask this to Cynthia for for Sedef. What, what's the role of monitoring and evaluation? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Pedro and Daria, uh, also for Pedro for setting the scene and emphasizing how important it is to look at the wider implications uh, of what our, our brochure, our leaflet is promoting and the values and decisions about vision that need to be taken by uh, stakeholders collaboratively collaboratively and decision making together with others when when let's say designing the services and the system and then what ro role career, career, guide career guidance can play and how important it is it actually to invest both financially and otherwise in career guidance and support learning and career development in specific provisions in services also developing tools and here i include ict tools and in uh, above all, in terms of quality in professionalizing the service. But it's also consider and uh, con important to consider and also very tricky, the outcomes for the different beneficiaries at different levels, which is really hard to measure in respect to the outcomes of career interventions because there are, uh, as you know, so many influences on, on, on career uh, in, in, uh, in a person's lives. So how do we begin to understand this and the role that career guidance can play in this especially uh, for, for adults and for employed in different circumstances in the workplaces. As the readers will be, will be able to see in the leaflet, there are a number of key elements that feed into quality in, in let's say, a designing a career services, provisions and systems, and, and, in, and for all types of workers. And this means also provisions scattered uh, about in different places, especially for adults. So trade unions, provisions, workplaces, external independent uh, public services like the public employment services uh, that sometimes and more and more catered to workers, at least in Europe, and then private services. And monitoring and evaluation, as you said, are key. Uh, and that also it is systematic. And whatever approaches need to consider above all, uh, and, uh, and this is happening more and more frequently, cooperation amongst the actors and also the collection of system-wide uh, qualitative and also quantitative uh, indicators. So what I mean is evidence, collecting evidence that is systematically collected and, and this should create feedback loops. Next is the user feedback, the feedback from clients, customers, users should be collected and this should be used to improve the services above all and also involving the, the, the professionals, the career practitioners in this process, and uh, also the, uh, the creation, uh, sorry, the creation of um, and the understanding of meaningful outcomes and process indicators for servant service and system improvement. And finally is the collaborative create, creation and use of quality frameworks, which use these meaningful indicators for assessing the inputs, the processes, so the career guidance interventions, process indicators, as well as the outputs and the interventions of the services and the range, and to look at how all of this uh, plays a role in looking at the range of outcomes for individuals, 
for societies, for the organizations, the providers, and at public uh, policy level. CEDAFOP is looking into this with public correction of expert papers. Maybe it will appear in the chat. Uh, volume one last year, and we held an expert workshop together also with our IAG uh, partners. And it was called Towards European Standards in Monitoring and Evaluation in Lifelong Guidance. And these are expert papers written by CEDAFOP and also external experts. And volume two is on the way, with exceptions suggested uh, common indicators and the results of the workshop. Uh, and in that collection of paper, you will find examples from Finland, Ireland, Germany, German Public Employment Services, and Poland. Uh, some, uh, let's say, theoretical conceptual overuse, but also some really fantastic uh, literature reviews. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, um, uh, Cynthia, and we'll, uh, we'll uh, touch upon uh, concrete cases later on in the conversation. Before I give the floor to Glenda, I'd just like to uh, say hi to those of uh, uh, our followers who uh, were so kind to let us know where they are um, watching from, we have Sandia from India, uh, Refik from Bosnia and Herzegovina, Sok from Cambodia, Vladica from uh, Serbia, Radica from Kosovo, Hamza from Morocco, Zainab from Tunisia, and then we have uh, Slovenia, Serbia, Kosovo again, Croatia, Holland, India, Albania. I mean, thank you so much. Uh, the geographic scope is really wide. Uh, and thanks also to my colleagues who are sharing the various links uh, in the chat and feel free to use those. Glenda, um, thanks for waiting. So the OECD recently conducted a survey on career guidance for adults. Um, can, you, can you please share the main insights, especially related to adult workers? Yes, absolutely. So the survey covers 11 countries and there's quite a broad range because we have Australia, we have the United States, we have Canada, but we also have France, Italy, Germany, we have Mexico, Chile, Brazil, Argentina. So it's a broad range of countries. And the point was to essentially put some numbers on what both Pedro and Cynthia have been saying so far. So understanding how many adults actually access career guidance, why they do it, what barriers they encounter, and a little bit also on the outcomes. So what we do find is that about 40% of adults, so four in 10, access career guidance every five years. Um, and there's a broad, there's big differences. So we have 50% in Australia and just 20% in Canada. Um, and then the reason why they do, many of them, is really work-related. So 85% of the respondents say that one way or another, they're looking for career guidance to improve in their current job. So career prospects in a current job, they want to change their job, or they're unemployed and they're looking for another, uh, for another job opportunity. Um, again, the, uh, those who do not access career guidance, where in a way we need to be concerned and we need to try and find ways to act to lower the barriers, say one, that they didn't think career guidance was particularly useful. So there is first an element of motivation, which we also see, for example, when people approach, ad, approach adult learning. So they don't see the point and they don't see how that's going to benefit them. There's another 25% who say they did not know that career guidance services existed in their country that they could actually access them. So these two elements, I think, already give us some idea of how we can encourage people to use career guidance more, especially if they're workers, they're looking for new careers or they're looking to progress in their own job. Another important element is uh, where do they go for career guidance? Cynthia was uh, mentioning different types of providers. We find that, in fact, a very large share of adults still access privately provided career guidance, which generates differences because pri between sociodemographic groups, because obviously if it's private, it's generally paying, and not all countries subsidize uh, privately provided career guidance. And there's another 25% who gets career guidance from the public employment service, which is useful in some ways, but for example, if we think of other, of workers, very few workers think of accessing the public employment service, even if in principle now many uh, PES, uh, public employment services, are open to all workers. And also, uh, you know, they receive career guidance that is very, very focused on re-employment and 
in some cases, very quick re-employment. So there's less thinking about the person's aspiration, consideration of their uh, skill set or of their interests, for example. So there are uh, po positive sides to this type of provision of career guidance, but also uh, some downsides. Uh, a last point, perhaps, on the outcomes. We do try and ask people, you know, what, uh, uh, what was their position six months after the access career guidance. Overall, we find that people actually did achieve uh, some of what uh, was their objective when they access career guidance. So, for example, 25% um, uh, say they managed to progress in their current job. Uh, there's another 30% who are workers who are looking to change job, and they did manage to do that. Uh, there's, uh, for the country, is where this is relevant uh, about 10 percent who move from informal to formal employment i think that's quite an interesting uh, finding as well and then uh, there is about 20 percent who actually access training at the end of career guidance potentially to again for, for a longer term objective of uh, of uh, improving their their career prospects both inside the company or uh, uh, through career transitions and i'll stop here for now thank you very much uh, glenda for this uh, comprehensive uh, overview which we'll uh, also touch upon in the last part of the conversation um we are mentioning the uh, the, um, the the workers, but uh, they we have a number of other players, and I'd like to ask Florian about uh, intermediaries, uh, employer organizations, workers' trade unions, and why are they key in supporting workers in their career development? And here I'd like also to flag that uh, in the last days on LinkedIn, there were a number of uh, exchanges commenting on, on this event precisely to put the spotlight on workers, uh, trade unions and, and their role and how they were also um, contributing to, to, this, uh, to this publication. Florian. Thanks a lot, Daria. And I mean, a lot was said already by the by the colleagues before, but I would say simply said there is no career guidance provider who can deliver to all people alone. So really cooperation and collaboration of a variety of stakeholders is the absolute must. And when we look at employer organizations, for example, they already provide a variety of services, including for finding and hiring workers to developing the skills of employees to companies and their employees. And we also see trade unions often um, have their company representatives that are in the companies providing guidance to colleagues. So it is kind of a natural thing to suggest that both stakeholders play a more official role in career development support. And I would just like to highlight a couple of examples that we put also in our joint statement that is being published today. For example, in Singapore, we have the Employment and Employability Institute, which is an inis initiative of the National Trade Union Congress. And they support national skills and lifelong learning initiatives and offer career guidance to at-risk or displaced workers. Or in Spain, we have the Forum Sul, uh, the foundation of the trade union Comisio Obreras um, of Castilla and Leon. They provide a systematic trade union approach to support workers, like in the famous but unfortunately no longer running Union Learn Initiative in the UK. So those systematic approaches are existing. And again, looking at employer organizations, on the other hand, especially those representing industry sectors and SMEs, they do play a key role in career guidance provision. For example, in Austria, uh, the Regional Chamber of Commerce of Tyrol supports the companies in their internal human resource development by offering employee counseling, talent assessment. They also support with staff development. What they did basically was they developed a map of future workplace competences and used it as a dialogue basis to discuss with business manager, with employees about the staff skills development, also with the staff, not just the managers. And a recent uh, research called Connect, it's actually an EU project, um, it was presented today at uh, the IAEBG conference, no, sorry, yesterday, 
Um, and it's interesting because this idea that career guidance within the company has to be biased only to the interest of the companies does not come out of that research. It rather says if we merge career guidance and human resource development, we really have a potential there to reach more workers. And that's also my final message. We need to go where the workers are. Employee organizations and trade unions are well placed to serve this group. And unions, I would say, are really particularly well placed to also reach out to informal people working in the informal sector or non-standard forms of employment to really address the needs of this group of people. on also a number of categories of workers in big companies, in SMEs, in the informal sector, uh, etc. Now we go to a very uh, interesting round of true and false questions. And since this conversation is lasting 30 minutes, I'll ask my guests to please reply whether my statement is true or false, and just add a maximum of 30 seconds explanation to why they are uh, assess, uh, saying that it is true or false. Starting with Cynthia from Cedefop. So Cynthia, Cedefop's analysis on disability and career guidance suggests that persons with disabilities often face additional barriers in their career path, such as limited access to career guidance services. Is this true or false, Cynthia? Uh, I would have to say true. Uh, in our analysis, uh, we've been doing together with our independent uh, network of well, independent experts in career guidance and development, CareersNet, uh, we've been looking at examples in our inventory of guidance uh, systems and, and practices, and that may appear in the chat. Um, we look at some uh, policies and, and practices uh, in, uh, in our monitoring of these uh, policies and practices which support the rights of persons with disabilities, including the right to career guidance services. And this includes uh, career guidance services in different settings. Um, and an estimated, just I mean, to give a, a figure, an estimated 87 million persons with disabilities live in the European Union. And besides the barriers in their daily lives, they, we also note uh, uh, difficulty in accessing career guidance services, and in particular, career support to education and training to jobs and careers fitting their interests and needs are often limited. I guess that's 30 seconds more, but that's 30 seconds. Well yeah. done. Thank you very much, Cynthia. So next is Glenda. Uh, the OECD's analysis on career guidance for adults reveals that low skilled adults utilize these services more frequently than high skilled ones. Is this true or false? Well, unfortunately, it is false. So low skilled adults tend to access career guidance less often. There's a very big gap. Uh, compared to high skill adults. And it's a pity because low skilled adults, uh, uh, for all the reasons we said, talking about the transition, how their jobs might be affected, stand to gain a lot more from career guidance. They need more support, accessing information, while high skilled adults are more autonomous in this. So I think uh, it, it comes back to some of the uh, points I mentioned before. Adults, and in particular the low skill, may not see the point of career guidance, what it's going to bring to them. Um, they may not know that career guidance is available, so even more than for high skill adults uh, who have networks and family networks also to gather information, we need uh, to reach out to them. There are some very good models, some countries that have used uh, community leaders and people uh, who have the same uh, also um, social demographic background as the low skill they're trying to reach. So they go, uh, this is for example in Victoria, in Australia, where they actually go uh, to uh, the local communities, the places where people meet, uh, trying to encourage them uh, to access uh, uh, career guidance. Similarly, 
I think uh, Florian mentioned uh, unions. Uh, so there's union learning in the UK, which does something similar. There are union learning representative in firms that go out and particularly try to provide guidance uh, to low skilled adults to encourage them to access training and address uh, uh, their uh, low basic skills, for example. Thank you very much, Glenda. Very uh, clear and synthetic. Florian, um, we've uh, already touched upon this topic, but we want to know more. So either ETF's findings suggest that the support of intermediaries can greatly enhance career guidance and development opportunities for workers. Is this true or false? Yeah, I would say yes. And uh, please be so kind and post that the link to the 10 country reviews that we did on national career development support systems in Eastern Europe and Western Balkans. They do show that there is quite little activity of social partners in career guidance, while at the same time what we see is they actually often do provide that service without knowing it, so to say, or calling it differently. And um, to, to answer the, the question in a different way, we met recently with the International Trade Union Confederation, the, the Pan-European Regional Council for Southern and Eastern Europe, and also with the Regional Union representative in Western Balkan countries. And the thing is that they're actually doing a lot in terms of supporting re- and upskilling and career development support. It's just not called as career development support. So I really see this huge potential there and capacity. Many things are happening. What it needs is a structured, systematic cooperation and collaboration approach between all the relevant stakeholders, including employer organizations and trade unions. Thank you very much, uh, Florian, and indeed the link to the conference was uh, posted by our amazing colleagues who are supporting uh, this uh, live conversation. Pedro, uh, the ILO advocates for career guidance as a tool to promote lifelong learning and continual professional development, which are crucial elements for social justice. Is this true or is it false? I will give a provocative answer, which is true to a certain extent. <laughs> Two, uh, in as much as, for example, we've uh, just recently approved the global strategy on lifelong learning, which was very strongly participated by the social partners in its definition. And of course, we hope to keep on working together to advance the strategy and guidance plays an extraordinarily strong role as a promotional factor to, uh, for lifelong learning. What I would um, rather say though is that guidance empowers people to identify and seize lifelong learning opportunities in line with their needs and their personal aspirations which it also helps refine so rather than the promotion of the system for the system itself so i think this is an important nuance in in what we are discussing and uh, of course Lifelong learning is extraordinarily important for the advancement of, of social justice. And I would like to mention a few aspects I didn't mention before, because I think it's important in breaking a number of negative cycles, because it, in, it enhances opportunities for the ones who haven't finished their, their, their basic schooling. It creates opportunities for uh, young people that are not in employment and they're not, and they're not in formal employment, let's put it like this, and adults are not in formal employment. So people who are working in an informal economy. It also helps people who are in mid-career, but in a career slump, and they don't know exactly how to leave it, how they should shift, in which direction they should go. This is a very important group that can't be neglected, and lifelong learning is, is there for that. And uh, it also, uh, when, when we come to the role of career guidance in relation to lifelong learning, what it strongly does is to make people aware that there is recognition of prior learning. There are quality micro-credentials out there that maybe can build towards qualifications and ease access into decent work. There are flexible learning solutions. There's work-based learning. So there's a plethora of solutions that people may not know and really may not know how to access. So I think this is important to, to underline also. Absolutely. And when we, we, we talk uh, about uh, workers and adult workers, we cannot uh, consider them as one uh, unique flat group. There are diverse stories, diverse backgrounds, diverse employment places, diverse countries. So thank you very much for, for flagging that. 
Um, before we close the conversation, I'd like to uh, go back to, to the chat because our followers have been actively participating. So I'd like to read two comments. The first one is from uh, Emma Perme, uh, who is saying uh, that it is very useful to have this event and thank you for sharing uh, the link. It's really inspiring to hear snapshots about the career guidance for workers uh, from Slovenia. Thank you very much for, for sharing your, uh, your thoughts. And then Laura Amati is writing, uh, what I notice and is not sufficiently addressed by the public policy discourse is the difficulty to change career, especially for people older than 35 years. Companies prefer people who have chosen a certain career immediately after school or university and do not want to risk to give a chance to people with the potential, but not the usual profile. Thank you very much, Laura, for, for sharing your thoughts. I, I think this uh, links also very well to the variety uh, of, of, of people and context, which was mentioned before. And also, if I'm not mistaken in the notes, I took uh, the, um, the, the behavioral and the cultural aspect, which uh, I think were mentioned by Cynthia. I hope I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, is anyone willing to comment on this point? And then we uh, wrap up and close the conversation. Maybe something uh, to say that uh, I feel now we do have kind of a unique opportunity on, on that point, on the point of, you know, recognizing people's skills as opposed to uh, recognizing people's experience and people qualifications only. Uh, and I think that's uh, unfortunately due to the many skill shortages we're observing everywhere. So we see that because companies are struggling to fill positions, they are a lot more uh, promoting approaches, which we're now calling skills first. But uh, both uh, I and my colleagues on the call have been, have been saying, you know, that we should look at skills rather than just pure and simple qualifications. So we should look at both. And I think now there is a bit of momentum on this. So there is more momentum momentum about uh, uh, you know making those transitions happen because uh, there is a need for uh, for skills and for workers and for reskilling and, and, and preparing uh, workers for transitions that uh, that there wasn't so so pressing before so thank you Glenda I see that Pedro is willing to add something just very briefly, I think this also goes hand in hand with what was mentioned a bit before, which is the development of more strategic approaches to uh, to the development of human resources in, in enterprises. Frequently, the choice is not to hire a new person, but actually to take care of the workers that you have and enhance the potential of the workers that you have. So the, the fact is that many enterprises are simply still not ready to uh, make these investments in, in terms of staff planning uh, and in terms of staff development. And you can identify critical pathways within the enterprise that amplify simultaneously opportunities for workers, productivity, competitiveness. So these things are not necessarily competing. Uh, and career guidance can be really the oil in the machine to help uh, all the, the, the parts that are involved. And I think that a lot of the enterprise level work, which is currently developed, uh, is, is illustrative of this uh, new reality. Thank you very much. Uh, Cynthia. I can add something here as well, just to, I, I could have linked it also back to the monitoring evaluation, but just a minute, mention career management skills, because we often, we talk about skills, you know, vocational skills, hard, soft, and transversal, and so on, but just to say that career guidance very much focus on these kind of, you know, career management related outcomes, and these should be really considered and taken into account when we think about the benefits and uh, of career management skills and also in terms of monitoring this and finding uh, ways of developing uh, at the national level, regional uh, career management skills frameworks. So this also supports the development of other skills. Uh, and so this is, sometimes this is a little bit forgotten in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. And Florian, for one last uh, conclusion. A very small reflection on the same topic that I was addressing before, simply that micro enterprises and SMEs have obviously less capacity to, to invest in their, their staff, have a, a real HR unit maybe even. So it's really important to put an ecosystem in place that allows companies also really to 
use the skills they have in company, be supported in hiring, finding the talent that they need. So it was all mentioned before, but just to put it in place again in the role of the social partners. Thank you very much, uh, Florian. Uh, so career guidance is the, maybe can I add the word, the green fuel in the machine that helps all parts function better together. Uh, I invite uh, all of you to please uh, click on the link which my colleagues have already shared and might share again and um, have a look at the uh, joint statement, a brochure prepared by the Interagency Working Group on Career Guidance, uh, comprising ETF, OECD, CEDEFO, ILO, World Bank, UNESCO, and the uh, European uh, Commission. And I'd like to uh, thanks, uh, thank our guests who were here uh, today for this 30 minutes discussion about career guidance for workers, a new approach. Thanks a lot to Cynthia Harrison, project manager for lifelong guidance and vet supporting policies from CEDEFO. Thank you for having been with us, Cynthia. Thanks a lot also to uh, Florian. I wanted to unmute there, but that was a uh, event. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks a lot also to uh, Florian Kadlitz, human capital development expert at the European Training Foundation. Thank you, Florian. Thanks a lot. And thanks to the whole team of speakers. Thanks a lot also to Glenda Quintini, Head of Skills Analysis and Policy Unit at the OECD. Thanks, Glenda. Many thanks. Thanks for inviting me. And thanks a lot to Pedro Moreno da Fonseca, Technical Specialist on Lifelong Learning Skills Branch at the ILO. Thank you. And thanks a lot to all of you who have participated live. I know that in the chat there are more questions coming. They will not be, remain uh, uh, un, un, untouched because we will get back to you in the chat. And also feel free to contact us and all the speakers anytime. And let's engage in the discussion uh, for the next days. So thanks a lot for watching. Thanks to all the technical team, to all the speakers, to all of you. And I wish you a beautiful afternoon. Bye.